Good day to my respected colleagues joining us from different time zones around the world. And a warm welcome to our second CyberX FM live webinar. I'm Dr. Avni Patel joining you from Malaysia. I am a family medicine specialist from Port Klang Health Clinic and I serve as the young doctor liaison of the Wonka Working Party on Ethics and Professionalism. I'm delighted to be your host for today's session where we have an exciting agenda that I believe will resonate deeply with all of you. Today, we'll be exploring two major topics that impact family physicians worldwide. Ethical challenges in using electronic health records and also cybersecurity ethics, particularly in protecting data and patient privacy. We're fortunate to be joined by two esteemed speakers who will share their insights and expertise on these critical issues. Now let's take a moment considering why we're even here. In our pursuit of simplifying our workflows, particularly with the integration of electronic health records, we often overlook critical aspects such as ethical considerations and cybersecurity. Upholding ethical values is paramount in our practice, whether in telemedicine or in-person care. We must ensure that we protect ourselves from potential negligence, even in seemingly minor situations. Furthermore, cybersecurity is an area that many of us have not thoroughly explored during our medical training years. Without a background in computer science, we often lack the knowledge necessary to safeguard our patients' data effectively. This webinar serves um, as a crucial opportunity to collaborate with experts in the field. In an age where technological advancements are inevitable, it's imperative that we stay informed and proactive. I hope you're as excited as I am to learn from our speakers today. Before we dive into our presentations, I'd like to introduce someone who has been instrumental in bringing this webinar to life. Dr. Cheryl Chan, who is a Young Doctors Movement Lead, will deliver the welcome address. Let's welcome Dr. Cheryl. Thank you, Afni. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Cheryl Chan, YDM Lead at Wonka. Welcome to the second cybersecurity webinar, jointly organized by the Young Doctor Movement and the Working Party on Ethics and Professionalism. Over the past few years, telemedicine has transformed primary care. While it improves access to healthcare and bridge geographical distance, there are some ethical and safety issues we must address. In our last session, we explored the application of telemedicine in primary care. Today, we are going to shift our focus on the ethical dimensions of telemedicine, particular, particularly on how we can safeguard our patients' privacy and protect their personal data. We are privileged to have two distinguished speakers today, Dr. Tanya, uh, Chair of the Working Party of uh, Ethics and Professionalism, and Mr. Horace Aoyan from Interpol. Um, Afni will um, introduce them more in, uh, in, in, the coming, in the coming time. So I will also want to extend my heartfelt thanks to our moderator today, Dr. Afni Patel, for her tireless work and efforts in bringing this webinar today. So thank you. Over back to you, Afni. Thank you, Dr. Cheryl, for that beautiful message. We are indeed privileged and we look forward to an engaging and informative session today, highlighting the intersection of healthcare and technology. Before we begin, I encourage all attendees to submit your questions along with the speaker's name in the chat box and your participation is valued. We look forward to engaging with your queries during the Q&A session. Let's move into our first presentation which covers clinical ethical challenges in using electronic health records. We're honored to have Dr. Tanya Morenhout, a general practitioner and lecturer at the Bioethics Center of the University of Otago, Dunedin, New Zealand. She combines academic work with a part-time clinical position. She graduated as a general practitioner in Belgium and completed a PhD in philosophy at Ghent University before moving to New Zealand in 2020. 
Her research interests are situated in the field of digital health ethics, with specific interests in the ethics of online consultations, electronic health records, and assistive technology used in aging in place. Dr. Marin Hout's expertise in digital health ethics is renowned, and I'm also privileged to work alongside her as she serves as the chair of the Wonka Working Party on Ethics and Professionalism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tanya Marin Hout. Thank you, Avni. That's a very kind um, introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you all here. Um, I'll just start by sharing my screen. There we go. I hope that's all working nicely. Um, first of all, apologies, because I've just um, had a bit of a cold to develop, so my voice is a bit eh, but I hope it holds for um, today's webinar. It should, hopefully. And um, I'm looking forward to, um, to talking about clinical ethical challenges in using electronic health records. This was also, um, um, the topic of my uh, PhD, and I'm still doing some further research related to electronic health records as well. So um, always a pleasure um, to talk about this and keen to hear your questions and comments afterwards. Um, let's get going. So what I wanted to talk um, to uh, you about today was, first of all, a bit of an introduction with a little bit of history of where do we come from with um, patient records? Why do we keep them? Um, and then what are the outcomes we want or um, also what are the current quite high expectations we have of EHR use. And then I want to focus on, on the main, um, I guess the, the main part of today's presentation, which are the ethical questions. Um, and I'll focus on confidentiality and granular control. I think that will hopefully tie in nicely with um, Horst's presentation as well. And then um, I'll talk a bit about sensitive information, what it is, how we can manage it, and um, also continuity of care and how the electronic health record can support us in um, that specific um, value or principle that we have in primary um, care. Um, so that's on the agenda for uh, today. Let's start with a little bit of history. How did we get here um, today in 2024? Um, actually, patient records go way back to ancient Egypt and to the time of Hippocrates. And I know I'm, I'm covering um, a large part of history there. Um, but it's good to know or to remind ourselves that back in, in the day, um, obviously, we didn't have an electronic record. But the record of a patient's illness or disease was mainly a chronological narrative of what happened to the patient. For example, on day one, the patient developed a fever, developed a rash, and often on day 30, um, the patient died, unfortunately, because the options for treatment were limited. But in that time, that narrative mainly served a didactic purpose, uh, meaning that it was mainly a tool for medical education. This was a way um, to teach future physicians how to, um, how to diagnose uh, people, how to identify illnesses, and how to manage them. Um, the record as we know it today, um, as an individual patient record, has actually only come to be um, in the 20th, maybe 19th century partly, but mainly in the 20th century, where it um, also got that longitudinal um, aspect to it. So the, the fact that we collect all the medical information of one patient in one file. Um, obviously, the one file is still something that we aspire. We, we often see a file in hospital and a file in primary care and a file in, in other places. But in any case, um, that's the idea that we can um, collect all a, a all the information on the patients um, in one record. Um, in the 20th century, that was mainly on paper. And with the introduction of the electronic health record, you see again a change happening. Digitalization has led to, to a few important changes. First of all, it makes it a lot easier to exchange health information. Um, while back in the day, you had to ask for paper copies of your record if you wanted a copy as a patient or as a colleague. Now that can be sent um, almost instantaneously. Um, it is also a lot easier for patients to have access to their record. Um, we see that 
a lot of the primary care practices have now um, committed to opening up access for patients in patient portal systems, meaning that results of lab tests um, can be shared. Patients can ask for script repeats all online through that record. And we've also seen a move to the use of more and more quantitative data or so-called more objective data, um, blood pressure, um, weight, um, height, you know, all of these uh, things are collected in the record. But we also see increased coding in different coding systems. These may be familiar to you, or at least some of them will be uh, for primary care, mainly um, ICPC. Uh, which also means that it becomes a lot easier to use all of the data we collect for secondary purposes, such as research. And that leads to what I've called informational multi-stability. So the information that we gather in the record doesn't just serve one purpose, that of patient care. It actually serves multiple um, uh, purposes. So that includes communication with the patient, um, also invoicing, um, there's research purposes, there's quality control, there's probably a lot more um, than those, but those are the main ones that we see being used today. And that brings me to the reason, well, why do we keep patient records? Um, it goes beyond that individual patient care. Again, these purposes that we see being used for most um, primary care physicians um, operating um, EHRs, um, where we see that there's also quite a bit of um, responsibility or pressure um, and additional work that lies with the healthcare providers um, in the sense that we are being asked when we interact with the um, electronic health record to make the information serve all those many different purposes. That may mean that we need to uh, put in information twice, or we may need to put it in the right format or in the right place. For example, if we read a letter that comes into our inbox from the hospital and there's a diagnosis on, on there, then we may need to manually also add it to the patient classification list. If we enter a patient exam, then we may have a specific place to put the blood pressure. We don't always just put it in the note. So the, um, the fact that we want that information to serve many different uh, purposes also means that we have to put in a bit of work so that it can be used for all these different purposes. That's um, at least how it usually um, goes. Now you could imagine that we have an alternative approach to um, serving those many different purposes. We could, for example, say, well, let's choose one focus and use that as our main focus of the uh, patient record. Um, and we could choose patient care. I've put a question mark there because it doesn't have to be patient care. We could choose a different focus. We could say research is the most important thing and focus on that. And that means that you would get a different uh, design of that patient record. But imagine that we say the patient care should be central, should be our main focus. Well, then you can imagine that we um, emphasize a strong narrative aspect so that we write the story of the patient, of the exam, um, and that we um, probably have quite a bit of uh, room for attention to differential diagnoses. Instead of necessarily coding everything, we may write, well, this could be uh, flu, or this could be uh, cancer, or this could be a post-viral cough, so that there's room to expand on differential diagnoses on um, a changing situation. And it could also mean that we um, say that other functions, like the fact that the information should also be usable for research, that that needs to move into the background. You could imagine now with um, AI that we even use natural language processing to comb through our written notes and to make sure that all the information that needs to go in other parts of the record is put in there. You could imagine that uh, such a, a natural language processing system goes through your inbox and then puts the diagnosis and the treatment plan into your um, patient history or classification. So that would mean that you would get a, quite a rich narrative um, approach 
to the um, patient records, and that the shareable part may be a bit more limited. It may be not as useful for research as it could be if we really tailor it to serve research purposes. So as you'll see, there are advantages and disadvantages to each um, approach. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think that question, what do we want to do with the information that we have on patients in the electronic health record? What purposes should it serve? What are the priorities? These questions are often not really asked. They're not being emphasized. They're not being uh, put very centrally. And um, if we want to adjust the design of our patient record system, then it's those questions that we need to start from. And then there are, of course, ethical implications of these choices, and this is where I'm interested in. But this is just to say, sometimes it would be good to take a step back, think about what are we doing with the electronic health record, with the information in it, and what do we want to do with it? So comes the question, what are the outcomes we want? And this is where today I think we face quite high expectations. Um, if we ask, what do we want to do with this electronic health record? Well, most people will say in the end, it should lead to better health care. And that means that we're expecting it to lead to safer medicine. It should be more accurate. You should see fewer medical errors. For example, through the use of warning systems in a prescription module, you hope to see that whenever we prescribe something that may have interactions with another medication the patient is on, that we get an alert and that we see fewer um, of these problems um, occur. We also expect it to enhance research. So again, that secondary data use, we have big data sets. We could learn a lot from all that information that we keep in primary care and don't always use for research purposes at this point. We can use it to coordinate care better. We can improve continuity of care by sharing uh, the information across primary and secondary care providers. And uh, one of the things that we always hope to do is to reduce costs. We want to save money. We want to make our system more efficient. And then we also want to engage our patient. We want to use it as a tool for patient education. All of these things come up um, when you talk about what is it that we want out of the electronic um, health record. And the ultimate goal um, can be summarized as better um, health care. Now, these high expectations can be problematic. Um, this is the example of patient uh, access. Patient access to the record, we expect that this will lead to better patient education, a more educated patient. A more educated patient is a more empowered patient who can be the manager of his or her own health. That will then hopefully lead to behavior and lifestyle changes and hence, again, better health and reduction of costs. Now, we seem to think, or sometimes it's expected that this sort of flows on um, spontaneously and automatically, and that is not always the case. Um, we had um, experiments a few years ago in Belgium where um, um, chest x-rays, well, where radiological images basically, and the reports were shared with um, patients. And one of the questions I got here is a patient looking at his chest um, x-ray and saying, oh my God, doctor, a whole part of my right lung is missing. There's something horribly wrong with my x-ray. Can you please have a look? And this is a true story. So this is a normal x-ray, but obviously um, a patient will not always know that this is the, the heart shadow and this is indeed a normal um, x-ray. And um, the report may say this is a normal x-ray, but when they look at the image, they may go, that doesn't really look normal, maybe they missed something. This is just an example to say the patient access does not necessarily automatically lead to patient education, does not automatically lead to patient empowerment, does not automatically lead to lifestyle changes. We will need to invest time, um, invest um, money uh, to a certain extent as well, um, if we want to see this process happening, it's not something that happens without doing anything else, right? So it requires effort. 
And this brings me to the main part of today, and um, those are the ethical tensions or ethical questions that arise um, with e EHR views. This is just to put there as a reminder um, for people who may not be thinking about ethics every day, just a quick recap of the four bioethical principles as they are often used in Western bioethics, at least. Um, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. I think the non-maleficence as first do no harm is quite entrenched in uh, global uh, medicine. Equity is something we think about a lot more as well. And then autonomy or um, can be expressed in different ways, but basically the right of patients to take control of their um, health. And um, I also wanted to give you the overview of the values that we see Again, globally, mainly emphasized in primary care or family medicine, we've got the four C's, accessibility or first contact to make it four C's, um, continuity of care, comprehensive care and coordination. And I've bolded the continuity of care and coordination because this is where the EHR may play a crucial role. Um, the other, the right hand side, so the other side of the slide shows you um, the values that um, Wonka Europe has now put in place and seen as central in family medicine. So you can see it's, it's become a bit broader. There's equity in their community oriented care. Um, continuity, cooperation are still there. And then the science oriented care, where you see that emphasis on research and obviously in primary care, we're sitting on this wealth of data. So the question is also going to be, can we use that for research and can we do that in an ethical way? And just as a reminder as well, um, before we dig in, it's quite complex. We've got multiple stakeholders involved in the EHR. It's not just patient and providers, it's also family members, it's administrators, it's researchers, and there's probably even more people in that involved, but those are the main groups. And then again, we wanted to serve multiple purposes. So not just patient care, but again, also communication, education, research, invoicing, and um, quality control. So that's why I wanted to focus on these um, four questions, um, confidentiality, granular control, sensitive information and um, continuity of care. So let's start with the first one, confidentiality. So confidentiality, I think we can all agree, it's been the cornerstone of the patient-doctor relationship since um, Hippocrates. And I realize I have a lot of Hippocrates um, in my uh, presentation anyway. Um, but already in 1982, um, and this is the year I was born, so it's a while ago, Mark Siegler um, declared that medical confidentiality was a decrepit concept. And he said that confidentiality as it had been traditionally understood by patient and doctors in that relationship, um, that it no longer exists. And the reason he wrote that was because he had a patient asking critical questions about all those people who were accessing his um, uh, record during a, a case of a, a very routine um, surgery. So that patient was admitted to the hospital for a cystectomy and asked Mark Siegler, well, I see so many people look in my then paper record. Is that all legit? Is that all part of the patient doctor um, confidentiality? And so, uh, Mark Siegler went and had a look and he calculated that when it comes to a routine surgery, you see that about 25 to 100 people, medical, administrative, you know, several roles, all had access to the record for some uh, or other legitimate reasons. So we're not talking about people peeking into record while they shouldn't be um, in that record. This was all legitimate access. So he realized that medicine was changing. It was way more based on teamwork. And that meant that that um, principle of confidentiality was changing. And so the question is, how do we protect confidentiality in the era of the electronic health record? And um, in that article, Siegler had a few suggestions. And I realized that they applied to the paper record, but they also applied to the electronic health record today. So there's two potential solutions. 
The first one is sequestration, or what he called a need to know basis, mainly saying that uh, people or uh, practitioners do not all need access to all the parts of the record. They only need access to those parts that they need to have for whatever they're doing with that patient. And this is a, a as you can see, more recent example from 2013. If a teenage patient's therapy for a chlamydia infection after a night of indiscretion is entered into an EHR in 2012, should it be retrievable to an orthopedist managing that same patient's hip fracture half a century later? Sequestration seems ideal for health data that is unlikely to affect future care, but could likely serve to embarrass patients. So here the question is, should we all, and by we I mean all healthcare providers, have access to all the information on a patient over time, over a patient's lifetime, basically. Now, there is a problem with this, and that's the problem of uncertainty or unpredictability. How are we going to decide which information is relevant now, but also which information may be relevant in the future, and then also for which care providers? So this sounds good in theory, but when we look at the real life situation, this becomes messy quite quickly. And then the question is, well, if we're thinking about sensitive information, what exactly is sensitive information? And if we label something sensitive information, could we be perpetuating stigma? Why not share information on an STI if we do not see it as necessarily problematic or embarrassing? So it's a potential solution, but it's also difficult to realize in um, real life. Another suggestion that comes from that Siegler article is to give patients granular control over who can access their records and what they can see. And he said, obviously, you need to have good informed consent because patients need to understand the risks and also the potential negative impacts of hiding information. If they decide not to share something, should know that maybe that affects their quality of care. I've turned that around and my question is, should patients be able to add information? If we really think seriously about patient empowerment, why not say that a patient could write their own history or maybe their so social history into the medical record? And research shows that patients are often seeking some level of control, and it can also be that granular control um, that they want, for example, their orthopedic surgeon to have access to certain parts of their record, but not other parts. While providers are quite concerned about this, are also concerned about patients adding information. So this also um, encourages, to think, encourages us to think about how this fits in patient empowerment and how we understand it. And this is a quote that I like, because it says, as usual, the devil's in the details. We may be closer to implementing the general system Siegler envisioned, but in so doing, we face an apparent battle royale among the important bioethical principles of autonomy on one side and then non-maleficence and beneficence on the other. The other approach that we could take is to say, well, confidentiality has changed quite a bit. It's no longer limited to one patient, one provider, but it's actually between a patient and their whole healthcare team. And we share the information widely without restrictions or granular control. So that could be another approach to this question of how to treat confidentiality in the EHR. Now, then again, the question comes up, what do we do with sensitive information. Um, as a quick recap as well, in the literature, there's usually about five categories of what's considered sensitive information. So there's sexual and reproductive health, there's mental health information, and interestingly, Siegler did not want to separate mental health from physical health. So he wanted to keep that in one uh, record. Uh, there's information on addiction, there's domestic and intimate partner violence, and there's genetic information, which now with genomics and more and more genetic information being shared becomes more important. So then the question is, if we do 
open up, well, open up in the sense um, we open up the um, information sharing between patient and the team. How do we manage sensitive information? And this is where we need to talk about stigma. A stigma about sensitive information can be at the patient side or can be at the provider's side. And the question here is, should sensitive information have a special status? And um, from that follows, should patients have a say about what information is shared with which doctor? So that brings us back to that option of granular control. Or should all information be treated the same, right? There's no sensitive information. All um, medical information is treated the same. Are we otherwise at risk of perpetuating stigma? And um, I think we are usually quite well aware of the risk of medical errors if we lack certain information, if we miss information in the record. But this is um, me challenging you to also think about the risk of medical errors due to maybe having um, too much information. And this is one of those examples of a case where you could see that there might be a risk of sharing. So this is a patient who's been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and anxiety, and she presents to the emergency department. She's got right lower quadrant abdominal pain and was sent home with a gastroenteritis diagnosis, but then returned to the ED following day, turned out to have an appendicitis. And she discussed that episode with her GP. As she says, she felt dismissed upon that first ED visit. She felt that the doctor did not really take her symptoms seriously and focus too much on the anxiety and the borderline diagnosis. So she asked the, G the GP, could you maybe hide that in my record so it's not available at first sight? So here the question becomes, to what extent does physician bias play a role? And is that something that we should be mindful of? And I know there are um, a lot of examples of training around um, unconscious bias. And um, I think it's interesting to see whether that also plays a role in how we manage information in the EHR. On the other hand, openly sharing sensitive information may also have benefits. And this is one example of Tom Delbanco, who's the co-director of Open Notes. So he shares notes with patients. And this is one example where he said, I wanted to write down alcohol abuse, but I couldn't do that with the patient just you know, watching me do that in the electronic health records. So this is where you see him talk to the patient and say, I think I should write alcohol abuse, but if you don't think it's a problem, then I shouldn't write it down in your record. But if you think it's a problem, then maybe we should write it down, agree on it and work on it. And then the patient said, doc, I think you should write it down. And that was then the key to opening up an intervention for the drinking and some changes he made in his life. So using the electronic health record to make sensitive information um, something that can be discussed in the patient-doctor interaction could be a benefit of sharing information. The last part of my presentation, I wanna quickly focus on continuity of care because I realize I'm running out of time. Um, continuity of care, I think we all understand relational continuity of care, um, which is at risk of erosion in primary care and that has multiple reasons. I'm not going into the details of that, but we see more uh, GPs working part-time there's a lot more teamwork, there's nurses and other um, allied health professionals involved, there's more complex and more fragmented care. All of these are reasons why relational continuity is under pressure. And we know that continuity of care improves quality of care, it reduces hospital admissions, and it even reduces mortality. So what we're seeing is a tension between having accessibility in primary care, because that may mean that you see whomever is available, whomever can take care of you, and continuity of care, meaning that you see the same doctor at multiple visits over time. We also see informational continuity, and that's the information that's available in the records to all um, the healthcare providers involved in a patient's care. And the question here is whether informational continuity might be able to compensate for the loss we see 
in relational continuity? And my answer is, yes, maybe um, there's an if, if these conditions are met, we may see an improved informational continuity of care if our results and our cold salts become searchable, because if you've got heaps of information but you cannot find anything, because you have, you have to scroll through years of results, that's a problem. They need to be interoperable, you need to be able to connect different systems and be able to find results in different systems. You need a very clear presentation of the history, so you need a very good patient summary that you've thought carefully about. And that should also include the patient narrative. We need some information in the record about a person's social history, their family background, and all of that. So in order to support this primary care value of continuity of care, we need these technical and clinical requirements to be met. And that also means that primary care practitioners need a seat at the table in the design, implementation, and evaluation of EHRs. So I've not talked about many other questions related to the EHR and ethics, and I've put them on the slide here. Um, I currently do research in the secondary use of primary care data for research and commercial purposes. Um, and I'm also looking at um, the use of AI scribes for EHR uh, notes. So if people are interested in these um, topics, happy to chat about them. But I hope that giving you an overview of these um, ethical questions related to um, confidentiality, granular control, sensitive information and continuity of care um, was useful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanya, for that enlightening session um, that highlighted a lot of the complexities in the ethical landscape surrounding electronic health records. And I've learned a, a lot of new terms such as sequestration, granular control. Um, I think that now I, I, I understand the importance of family physicians um, needing to be involved in the design of electronic health records itself because um, the, the reason it was created in the first place was probably to save time, but there's so much more use of uh, electronic health records now, and there needs to be, um, um, we need to actually uh, look at the purpose of it and, and design it according to the purpose uh, that we're using it for. And um, um, I think that thing you mentioned about um, sequestration sounded like, you know, um, when we write down something in the records, you know, we are also, um, you know, it, the patients may feel like they are, the past is haunting them, you know, even though they may not have anything to do with what they did five to 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So thank you so much. And um, uh, please, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Tanya, you're welcome to type them in the chat box and they will be discussed later. Now, let's hear from our next speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Horace Aoyang from Interpol, who has graciously joined us for the second time, having also delivered valuable insights during the first CyberX FM webinar. Mr. Horace was seconded to Interpol in 2023 and assumed the post of coordinator of ASP Desk Cybercrime Directorate. Before his secondment, he served as the Chief Inspector of Police of the Hong Kong Police Force for 14 years, where he held various roles, including Head of Digital Forensics and Section Head of the Cyber Intelligence Unit. Mr. Horace holds a Master's Degree in Computer Science. Let's welcome him to the stage. So Horace, you're muted. Hold on. Huh? Hello. Um, can anyone hear me? Yes, loud and clear. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Everyone, thank you very much for um, inviting me to um, share with all of you 
Um, it's my pleasure to um, speak on behalf of Interpol today and um, talk about the cybersecurity ethics. So um, I I just shared the screen. Can uh, can you see my screen? I just shared. Yes, we can see. Yeah. Okay. So um, today uh, I'm going to talk about the protecting data and patient privacy issue. Uh, so um, uh, the main idea is to ensuring trust in the healthcare system in this digital age. So um, uh, before I start, just uh, simply uh, introduce myself. So I am a security officer um, in Interpol right now. I'm now working as a coordinator at ASP desk. Um, so my major role is to coordinate joint operations among uh, member countries within the region. Um, so I will finish my secondment uh, next October. So uh, I will still working uh, with the member countries, with, including um, Asia and South Pacific region uh, for around 10 more months. And then I will return to uh, Hong Kong police and continue my uh, service. So um, here is my email. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. So for today's agenda, um, uh, apologies that uh, I don't have much uh, medical knowledge because uh, <laughs> I'm a police officer. So I just try to address the topic in in the view of a law enforcement agency. And then um, so um, firstly, I would like to talk about the importance of uh, cybersecurity in healthcare. And then to uh, let you know more about cybersecurity. And next is some uh, case sharing. Um, so I will bring out the importance of uh, working in partnership with uh, various stakeholders. Uh, and then some. I also introduced some Interpol's enforcement action before the, the end. Uh, and last but not least, I will uh, try to highlight some cybersecurity advice to all of you. And then uh, finally, the Q&A session. So I will simply spend uh, around 15 minutes for my uh, presentation. But uh, if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to uh, uh, drop it in the chat box and Dr. Envy will uh, assist us uh, later. So um, first of all, uh, it's very important um, to maintain the cybersecurity in, um, I would say, every industry, every aspect. Um, so in healthcare, it's also important. And here I just uh, uh, list out a few very important points that related to the healthcare system in uh, and related to the relationship between um, doctors and patients. First of all, is the um, patient data. So, um, so hospitals or clinics, um, I believe you must keep a lot of patient data, including personal identification, like uh, ID card, um, including some medical histories, um, financial information and etc. So um, we, we need to ensure that cybersecurity take place and help to safeguard this information uh, from all unauthorized access and breaches. Okay, and also um, compliance with law and regulations that um, regulations in various countries may be different, but I believe the aim is more or less the same, which is mandate strict guidelines for protecting patients' information. Um, Lot compliance of these regulations, laws can lead to uh, fine and legal consequence. Um, yeah, so there, there are some uh, cases uh, reflecting those uh, uh, negligence of the companies or the centers uh, and have some bad consequence at the end. So, um, the third point is trust and reputation. So it's talking about the trust between the doctors and patients. Patients need to trust that their personal information is very secure. Um, so a breach can damage the reputation 
of the healthcare providers, um, the organization, um, also leading to lose of patient confidence and uh, at the end, ruin the business. Um, the fourth point is uh, protection against cyber threats. So uh, as you know that uh, I believe you you may aware that uh, cyber attacks appears anywhere, anytime. Um, so the healthcare sector uh, is also a primary target for cyber criminals because um, the value of health data. Uh, so um, we need to implement uh, measures to protect uh, this kind of data and then prevent from the cyber threats. Uh, I have introduced something like uh, ransomware, phishing, data breach, malware, and etc. And actually, I had uh, covered a little bit the the mo of the of the uh, cyber attacks in the previous uh, webinar. Yeah, and the last one I list here is the prevention of financial loss. Um, so, um, cyber attackers can result in significant financial losses. Uh, due to uh, um, recovery costs, like uh, legal fees, the, the company, the hospital, the clinics may be uh, facing the legal challenges or um, legal fees or uh, some claims from the patient and also the potential compensation uh, to the affected patients. So um, investing in cybersecurity actually is a very good means to prevent for further loss and can help mitigate this risk. So uh, let's understand cybersecurity. Uh, I just uh, make four bullet points here, uh, try to make it simple. Um, we can think about, um, can we secure our hardware, our software, network, and data? So for hardware, Simply, you can think about the computers or the device that you're using. Is it physically secure? Um, are there any other unauthorized persons that can access such hardware uh, easily? Um, for example, some IoT devices uh, uh, that are crucial for data protection as well. Um, some servers, uh, can anyone access those servers very easily and then for example, like grab the whole um, hard disk uh, away from the servers, or they can uh, um, copy the data easily. Um, so it's talking about the, the hardware side. On the other hand, um, secure software, actually uh, talking about the complex systems. Are there any loophole, any backdoor? Um, and um, for, for secure software, actually helps safeguard against uh, those cyber attacks like um, exploits and um, malware and other cyber threats. So um, it's, uh, it's essential to have regular updates that I, I will talk about more later. Um, and then uh, for the network, uh, do you know uh, if your, your network is secure that uh, the outsiders, like the hackers, the threat actors, they can easily uh, slip into your network or, um, sorry, something pop up. Yeah. Uh, so are there any uh, 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 sufficient protection for the network, like to prevent the man in the, in the middle attack, um, to uh, grab the data, through the internet or through the intranet? Um, are there any encrypted connection between the uh, servers and uh, uh, those uh, computers, uh, octos and etc.? cetera? Um, also the, the similar idea is to prevent from an authorized access and uh, for data protection. Uh, the last one is the secure data. For example, uh, if those companies, uh, the organizations, they opt for using cloud servers, uh, are those uh, cloud servers uh, reliable? 
um, are there any backdoors that uh, leakage may be occurred uh, somehow uh, accidentally or or being attacked by the threat actors? Um, or also uh, for data, are there any backup? Uh, because there may be some uh, human errors or uh, hardware failure or like um, uh, electricity shortage uh, uh, that shut down the whole system. So are there anything you can implement to protect such a, a valuable data? So uh, these are the uh, areas that we, we can pay attention to uh, enhance the cyber security. So the, uh, here I just highlight a uh, uh, ransom rare attack case um, occurred in US in February. This is um, a ransomware attack and data breach at Change Healthcare, um, which is the uh, largest known digital theft of US medical record case. Um, and as you can see on the screen, uh, from the title, actually, this uh, cyber security incident affects over one hundred million people in US. Um, so the organization um, they realized that they were under attack and then um, try to uh, prevent uh, uh, loss and then try to inform the affected individuals in late to nine. But uh, at this time, they are still continuing the the action because uh, it affected too many people. So uh, in this case, uh, stolen uh, personal data uh, varies by individual, but the organization previously, previously just confirmed that it includes personal information such as name, address, dates of birth, uh, phone numbers, email address, um, government identity documents, um, social security numbers, driving license, passport, but also the um, patient data, um, like the diagnosis, diagnosis uh, medications, test results, um, some imaging, um, care and treatment plans, many, many data were leaked out um, and grabbed by the threat actors. Um, so for, for those uh, threat actors, uh, this kind of data are very valuable because uh, they there are many different purposes uh, for using this data they, they obtain illegally. For example, they can uh, sell them uh, on the dark web, on the internet uh, to others who find interesting. Um, let's say they can do some extortion, um, they can do more uh, criminal actions um, uh, like intrusion. Uh, so too, too many uh, uh, way forward. If the uh, data were uh, obtained by other uh, cyber criminals. Um, so uh, as you can see here, um, from time to time, uh, Interpol always emphasized the importance of working in partnership with other stakeholders and hope we can um, prevent those uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents. So here I just highlight one, one of the many uh, cooperations with other stakeholders. And this is a World Health Organization and they produce two reports in collaboration with Interpol uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, um, the UN Office of Counterterrorism, the UN International Computing Center, uh, and other parties to compile two reports. Um, the first one highlights the uh, far reaching real life impact of um, cyber attack on healthcare. Um, especially um, during or after COVID-19. Um, so this disease uh, uh, or these outbreaks 
bring us a lot of help uh, system globally and which have turned to digital solutions to enhance the clinical quality and the cost efficiency of the service. Um, this has created digital dependency, which has uh, advanced sometimes without careful consideration of new risks uh, and appropriate investment in cybersecurity aspect. And of course, as I mentioned, sensitive information held by the health services um, coupled with uh, inadequate security makes healthcare in infrastructures. Um, so WHO share suggestion um, for the member states to you know, enhance the security in the healthcare sector by leveraging uh, shared cyber security capabilities. And um, there is another report which um, reflects on different approach to counter disinformation. Uh, and other uh, thing like um, disinformation, unlike misinformation, um, is created with malicious intent to, uh, you know, disharmony the society, uh, mistrust in targets such as government agency, uh, scientific experts, or uh, public sector, public health agency, public sector, and etc. So um, this report addressed the uh, uh, the importance to tackle the, the disinformation issues. Um, besides working in partnership with other private sectors or other organizations, um, Interpol also um, focusing on uh, operations. So um, this is the uh, operation that I'm working on, which is uh, Asia and South Pacific Joint Operations Against Cybercrime. Um, so we uh, focus on uh, to tackle malware, phishing, info stealer, and ransomware. Um, so uh, just very brief to introduce it one by one. Um, malware is the software um, cause disruption to the computer, server, client, or network. Um, phishing is a form of social engineering and um, scam the victims, where the uh, attackers deceive people in into reviewing sensitive information uh, like their uh, credit card credentials or login password, something like that. Uh, for info stealer, yes, uh, uh, you, can, you can imagine, just name it. Um, it's the uh, malicious software to uh, breach computer system and steal sensitive information. Um, and ransomware uh, may use the uh, uh, crypt cryptography to uh, lock the system files or lock the whole system um, and then ask for ransom uh, from the victims. So um, I would like to highlight um, one operation that we have just concluded is this uh, Synergy 2 uh, targeting those uh, kind of cyber crimes. Um, so we we tackle the uh, malicious servers, IP address, uh, domains around the world, um, and request our member countries to uh, assist and try to shut them down, take them take them down, and um, also conduct searches and arrest operations. So um, here is the uh, results for Asia and South Pacific. Um, there are 20 countries involved in this operation. Um, um, we successfully taken down uh, over 12,000 uh, servers and IP addresses. Um, there are 35 um, threat actors arrested, and then uh, over 20 uh, electronic devices were seized, and uh, over 20 house searches conducted as well. So um, you you may have a question whether uh, um, are there any uh, cyber crime cases involving healthcare uh, that we work with? Like just like I mentioned, we we are targeting malware, 
we are targeting ransomware, info stealer. So actually all of these uh, attackers, they may target uh, different industry like financial, government, um, private sectors, and of course, including healthcare. So, so um, that's why you also need to pay attention and be uh, alert at all time. And so when we uh, take down such a uh, C2 server, such infrastructure that uh, adopted by the threat actors, so which can also leverage the uh, uh, um, the risk uh, uh, created by those threat actors. So uh, here uh, I just uh, highlight some uh, cybersecurity advice um, for you to uh, take a look. So the first one is a uh, regular and timely update. So for the, the uh, um, developers, so no matter software or hardware, they, they frequently uh, issue the update patch um, to, uh, you know, uh, befriend uh, or to um, befriend the, the uh, loophole that being uh, misused by the threat actors. Um, so if you receive the uh, information, receive the uh, alert, that asking you to update your system, update your software, please do it as soon as possible. And also um, need to enhance the awareness. So um, you know more about um, cyber crimes, you know more out about the MO, and then actually can help you to uh, know uh, not to be the next victim. Yeah. Um, and then regular training and circulating reminders. So helping the staff uh, within the industry to um, know more the uh, regulations, know more the contests, know more the do's and don'ts, um, remind them some uh, risk factors uh, of maybe some of those high risk uh, actions that you're not uh, advised to do. So for example, using uh, an authorized um, USB device or uh, download an authorized uh, uh, software, something like that. Uh, re keep reminding our staff and then uh, appointing them to be the next victim or, or fall into the scams, something like that. And strong, pa strong password, also very important. Uh, keep your device uh, secure. And also, yeah, antivirus, firewall, um, intrusion detection system, all of these are uh, very helpful to protect your computer system. And the last two points I think is uh, very general, but uh, you need to bear in mind is, uh, uh, the first one is uh, think twice before action. If you have doubts, please don't act and think, think before you act. And the second one is, if you have really any doubts, seek assistance or seek advice from others. Maybe you, you, you are not very good in something, but always you can ask others for like second opinion, similar to uh, the patient uh, ask second opinion to another doctor, something like that, yeah. So for the don'ts, uh, I also listed some here. Um, so uh, first of all, I believe I, every organization uh, must have their own um, regulations or guidelines and such guidelines and must have their purposes. So don't violate those uh, security guidelines. Um, just, uh, just I said, uh, like not using uh, unauthorized devices, um, not going to uh, risky uh, uh, websites, um, yeah. And then the second one is uh, don't be lazy, all right? Uh, try to back up your data uh, regularly because even though, for example, touch wood, if you are under ransomware attack, all your files were uh, encrypted, but you still have your backup here. Um, so you don't need to pay the ransom to uh, obtain the decryption key from the criminals, which 
they they are not guaranteed to give you, right? Uh, you you pay, but you cannot decrypt, and then you you get nothing. But if you back up your data, at least you have something in your hand. Uh, the next one, do not click uh, on the suspicious hyperlinks, um, the fake emails, some pop-ups, and uh, scan unknown QR codes. All of this uh, need to avoid because you don't know what you you uh, you being redirected to. For example, those uh, fake website which look similar or almost same as the genuine website. Uh, and uh, for, for email, there may be email scam, someone pretended to be the CEO of the hospital or the CFO of the organization that requests you to do something illegally or uh, like transferring money out. So uh, be alert, Not um, you need to review it before. You need to check before, confirm before. And then uh, of course you, you, you don't, disclose your password or personal details to uh, any other one uh, to safeguard your property, to safeguard the uh, uh, system. And then, uh, yes, an authorized software, because you you don't know um, uh, the security level of those unauthorized software, or maybe there are children um, bound inside the software. Um, so some organization, they actually have the white list or some they have the black list of the software. So just follow um, and then to, to protect your, your uh, computer system. Yeah. So by concluding um, my presentation, there are two words. The first one is professionalism. So um, the patient come to uh, visit the doctor and I believe they expect um, they are protected no matter the health or their uh, uh, personal data, right? So, um, and and then it's related to the trust. The first one is the trust between um, doctor and patient, and the other trust is between different stakeholders. Um, I always say trust is very important because when we tackle um, cyber crimes, um, law enforcement agency cannot work alone. Um, is cost jurisdiction, um, victims in country A, suspect in country B, but infrastructure in country C, D, E, F, G. So it's, it's a global issue. That's why we always emphasize uh, Interpol working in partnership with different um, partners, stakeholders around the world to tackle cyber crimes together. So uh, without trust, we work alone and we cannot reach our goal. Yeah. So um, now may I uh, ask the floor back to Dr. Av and then to uh, conduct the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Horace, for a very informative session on cybersecurity. And now we truly understand the importance of having um, cybersecurity measures in healthcare to protect uh, patient privacy and data. Okay, um, now let's go to a impromptu discussion. And um, I would like to um, discuss a bit on ethics with Dr. Tanya about um, regarding your research um, that I that was published recently on ethical assessment of virtual consultation services. You developed a practical ethical checklist that healthcare providers can look into. And to tie that in with your presentation on uh, ethical challenges in electronic health records, how can family physicians, as they integrate new digital technologies in their, in their um, um, healthcare, uh, and also when they, if they have new uh, electronic health record system, how can they uh, utilize these ethical values uh, appropriately? Um. Tricky question. Um, yeah. So we currently see that there is an influx of new options and new tools. So we've got the electronic health record and mm -hmm. then um, many countries see um, telehealth being used a lot more since um, COVID. 
with yeah. um, there, there are specific challenges to to that as well and then there's the um up and coming use of um ai we see the use of ai scribes for notes taking and um we see that a lot of um family physicians start using ai for many different purposes um to write patient letters to you know that there's there's a, a whole variety of things that you can do with it um, I think one of the main issues is that we don't always have the regulation in place to know which of these new technologies we can trust, we can use safely, um, that will protect privacy and confidentiality um, or not. And then, as you mentioned, the second thing is that the, the ethical considerations often get ignored, at least in, in the first um, use. And this is why we developed this um, um, ethical checklist so that when people start using um, telehealth applications that they can go over a few things a bit like a checklist to tick the box exercise which is not ideal from an ethics perspective because we always like to think a bit more richly and you know ask the difficult questions and use reflection but then when it comes to a busy um, primary care physician's life then you really need to go okay I, I want to use this new tool is this actually a good thing or not and so we tried to develop these specific um, areas like um, confidentiality, but also equity, taking into account that um, not all patients may have the literacy to use these new technologies or may not have the software and the hardware. Um, does that mean that some people are missing out? So just to give people um, a, a sort of checklist they can use to think more critically about these new um, digital tools. And I always say, when it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Um, so for example, with um, the new AI scribes, you see um, the advertising that says, oh, it will save you heaps of time. Yes, that's true. But we will also need to put in work to check those notes that come from that are AI generated, basically, because we know there's the risk of hallucination. There yeah. may be errors in those notes. And so it's, again, the responsibility of um, the GP to check all of that. So my advice would be um, to exercise caution, to not get caught up in the big promises, but to be realistic about these new tools. Yes, they can be great and they can um, save us time and they can improve quality of care, but they usually also come with some risks and challenges that we need to deal with. Yeah, I think... Um we don't only need to think about these ethical questions after we have implemented these technologies into our um, mm. healthcare system, but it should be at the beginning, before we start even. And then as we go along, keep asking these ethical questions and perhaps redesigning it according to the purpose that we're using it for. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Tanya, for that answer. Okay, I also want to... Um, Ask Mr. Horace. Actually, there's a question in the chat box um, for Mr. Horace. Um, Sonia Sukagoshi mentions that she has received emails from someone imitating the president of Wonka Europe or other members of Wonka. So for all of us, what should we do with regards to such um, emails? Um, how do we report them to law enforcement, especially in view of uh, it being an international organization such as Monka. Yes, um, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, so I think this kind of uh, business email compromise um, happen everywhere. Like even I just read the news uh, in Hong Kong that someone pretend the commissioner of police to send out an email to, to others uh, with intent to scam people. So um, the first thing we need to do is to confirm whether the email is the genuine one or is a fake one. So simply uh, checking the uh, email address, the domain, and ensure that it's a, it's a fake one. For example, like um, misspell some characters of the word. So like, like um, Wonka, uh, W-O-M-C-A, then, then it's totally another thing, right? Um, and other, uh, if, even if it's correct, 
we also need to uh, further check if the email account of that user uh, have been compromised or not. Because some some act uh, attackers they may hack into the system and again gain the assets of the mailbox. So we need to confirm whether uh, um, the the use the the genuine user is facing um, cyber attack or not that uh, did anyone other than himself access such uh, e email and then send out those uh, email. If uh, after these two actions, we confirm that it's a fake email or, or uh, not genuine email and with intent to scam something like that, then we can start considering to make a report. Mm -hmm. So, um, for Wonker, I'm not sure uh, who is the email service provider, but um, it's always uh, most confident is that uh, either the receiver, like Sonia, uh, uh, report the case, or um, the organization, like now the Wonker, uh, uh, report the case. Uh, and it's good if Let's say let's say the server of uh, Wonka email is in Singapore, for example. So Wonka can make a sing, uh, make a report to Singapore Police Force in Singapore, which is uh, the most direct way for the law enforcement agency to investigate. Yeah, because um, we we uh, may have some uh, limitation uh, about uh, doing the in investigation of these kind of cases like. Uh, we need to locate the server, we need to identify the uh, log records, we need to get such information from the service provider. So if we have the appropriate reports, um, I, I mean, make the report correctly, uh, actually we can save more time. Otherwise, like for example, the server is in Malaysia, but we make a report in Singapore. So um, I believe the law enforcement will uh, also accept the report, but uh, they need to do uh, extra extra things like to request information from uh, other jurisdiction and then get verification, get further investigation so as to take out the uh, threat actors. Yeah. Um, so obviously this this kind of uh, business email compromise is a, is a criminal offense. So, uh, you can consider like screen capture it or um, download it or save it and preserve it as a piece of evidence and provide to the law enforcement agency for their uh, further investigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Horace, um, for that answer. Um, I also want to ask in terms of patients' um, perspectives, right? Because you've shared with us what do physicians, what are the steps that physicians need to take to ensure uh, cybersecurity. But what about um, the internet of medical things, vulnerabilities that you mentioned, whereby patients are increasingly using um, smart devices and wearables, and um, which is very helpful for, uh, for, for uh, healthcare providers to monitor their health. But patients also risk um, their data being uh, sold, you know, because as you mentioned, health data is very valuable. Um, so how what can we tell our patients? Um, how do they also um, uh, have uh, proactive measures? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in this case, I would advise the patient to use uh, only the authorized applications. For example, the um, hospital authority of the country that they may um, develop their own applications. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so make sure that um, the patient, they know where to um, download such applications, which is a genuine one, um, especially for Android devices, because um, the APK file could be easily uh, amended or uh, uh, some malware may be intruded into the application and then put the APK file on third party uh, uh, download platforms. So uh, I think it's uh, very important to you know protecting the um, the safety of 
uh, at the patient side. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank and, you. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. One sorry. One more thing is the yeah. uh, uh, I've uh, uh, installing antivirus. Mm. Yeah, or some kind of uh, anti scam um software. For example, like um, Singapore Police Force, they uh, created an application called uh, Scam Shield that that can block the uh, unknown or sorry to be exact the non criminal uh, or, or suspicious um, phone calls. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, like um, Hong Kong Police Force, they also invented the applications named. Um, um uh cyber defender mm -hmm. so um uh this application can uh pop up the alert when you are dealing with the suspicious mobile phone numbers email address uh um um uh, domain mm -hmm. um bank account uh yeah so everything's uh if they're suspicious uh there are alert pop up and then to remind the user I don't uh, please pay attention. Be careful. Don't fall into the scam. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, the application is called Scammeter. Yeah. You mentioned installing these antiviruses. These would be installed into their main devices, right? For example, they're using a smartwatch. We will install it into their computer. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. you can their mobile phone. Go, sorry, mobile phones. Yes, yeah. because the. the the smartwatch actually linked to, linked the, to the phone. Mobile phone. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I have one more question for Tanya, actually. Um, you mentioned about um the the care that we need to use when we are uh, documenting sensitive uh, patient information, especially the ones that lead to uh, stigma. For instance, um, patients who are alcohol abusers or, you know, if they have um, uh, sexually transmitted infections. So um, how is it different recording this sensitive information into electronic health records versus documenting them manually uh, in, in clinics that do not have these systems? What is the impl implication? Yeah, good question. So it's, um, I think the level to which the information can be shared and easily shared is the main difference. Mm -hmm. When it's a paper record, it's sitting somewhere, but only the people in that room or building or hospital have access to it. Mm -hmm. um, when it's shared electronically, if we, for example, add um, some of these categories of sensitive information to a patient summary that's shared more widely, then that may be the first thing that um, care providers see even before they meet the patient um, in person. Um, now, that being said, um, I think this opens up that debate around what is sensitive information and is there still stigma attached to it or not? Um, I think there are good arguments to say that we should um, um, talk more openly about what was you or what used to be considered as sensitive information. Um, things like addiction, recognizing that it is um, a, a mental health illness and um, that it can be treated like any other um, physical illness and sort of trying to take away the stigma um, from it. So it could be that if we do start sharing um, sensitive information more widely, obviously among healthcare providers, that that also reduces stigma, both with yes. providers as well as uh, patients. Now, one of the things I am concerned about is um, related to genetic information specifically, as sharing that more widely may have huge impacts for people's insurance. So we already see in a number of countries that if people want life insurance or health insurance, that they're being asked for to share their health um, information. And if they have genetic information in there, that may be used as an argument to exclude certain illnesses if they are at risk for those illnesses. So I think that's a much more difficult debate in the digital era. Should we exclude that information for that reason? I think this is something that we will see in the next few years come up um, a lot more often. 
Do you have any experience of involving patients um, in this debate? Uh, are patients also a part of um, um, the discussion whether their information should be shared or shouldn't be shared? Or is this mainly only done by healthcare workers? Well, I think there's quite a bit of research involving patients. I'm aware of at least one study in uh, Singapore um, where they set up um, uh, what they call citizens jury to talk about, you know, should this information be shared with um, with um, insurance companies um, specifically. Um, so there is involvement of patients, um, but mainly, I think, in a research um, context. Um, to know what's the patient's view on this. And usually patients are quite concerned and wary when it comes to sharing that with insurance companies or um, commercial companies, um, if it's not, you know, not the trusted organizations that they see like research um, institutions. So yes, um, I think including that patient voice is, is very important as well. Okay, thank you so much to our both speakers. Finally, we have arrived at the end of our um, seminar. I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks um, to Dr. Tanya Morenhout and Mr. Horace Ao Young for sharing your expertise and your valuable insights. Music